Uh, so nice to see everybody. We had a few technical difficulties, obviously, uh, but we'll try to move it along. We're a little behind schedule. So hopefully everybody has turned off their cell phone. Okay, I knew, I always want to ask that. And hello to everybody on Zoom. Sorry about the delay. Hopefully you've been able to tune in. Uh, but uh, today, of course, is uh, the atomic bomb and the end of World War II. And we are going to be talking about Japan and the road to war with the West. And this is going to be very abbreviated from uh, uh, the road to the war piece from because I covered this in so much detail in my previous class. But I think it's important that we look at this a little bit, uh, how they but it's more really about Japan and the government of Japan in regards to this class than than that piece. So we'll we'll get there. But one thing I should have mentioned perhaps in a little bit more detail last week was when I was talking about Japanese anti-communism, you may remember I briefly talked about uh, the Bolsheviks murdering the Tsar and his family. And that's a key piece to the Japanese because quite honestly, they're very, very concerned about regicide. So since regicide is a major fear for them, because of course the way they're structured, then I think I should have mentioned that probably in a little bit more detail. That again, that's a real big issue after uh, the Bolsheviks take Russia, how much that influences even more so than had already been occurring Japanese anti communism. And on that note, let us get started with something I talked to you. I said I would talk about in more detail last week, which is Kokutai or national polity. So we have to understand there's multiple versions of Kokutai, but the primary one for our purposes today is this first one. And that is that you have to view the Japanese government as not just a the people, but as a racial policy as well. Uh, there's the Shinto religion, of course, uh, and I talked about the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki, which are uh, documents that were created around 711, 720 uh, common era that would show the lineage of the emperor and the other uh, royal families of Japan. Well, those are based on the myths of the Shinto religion. But when we look at Kokutai in this regard, we have to see Kokutai as being this piece is historical fact. So the emperor really does uh, come from the goddess Amaterasu. And because he comes from that goddess, they have an, a, a, a spiritual as well as a regular government. So that's really critical that Kokutai is thought of as a uniqueness of the Japanese polity as issuing from a leader of divine origin. That's the first piece of Kokutai. Okay. The second piece is actually you can understand Kokutai as uh, part of the constitution that they receive from, well, they didn't receive, they basically uh, used to create their own constitution. That was the German constitution for Kaiser Wilhelm II and I. So that, abs that aspect of Kokutai is that the emperor, the Tenno, is an organ of the state. So since he's an organ of the state, he is the head of the state, but he's, it's not spiritual, it's not religious, he is a secular leader in effect. Now, the second piece here, uh, which the, we will refer to as the organ theory, puts you in a very, very difficult position, because if you tell people that you believe in the organ theory, your health is at great risk. So you may not want to share that too much with people. Then a simple sentence for Kokutai is, Kokutai are national polity, meaning the uniqueness of the Japanese people in having a leader of spiritual origin. Now, some historians, Miller particularly, sees this as how being used by what he refers to as a fascist, fascist nationalist clique. And he says this, Kokutai had become a convenient term for indicating all the ways in which they believe the Japanese nation as a political as well as racial entity was simultaneously different from and superior to all other nations on earth. So 
basically they will use this and his thinking that this is part of how they will be seen as a fascist group. I will say some of that I would agree with, but not 100%. And then the last thing I want to talk to on this, this slide is Kodo Shigisha, uh, which is the Imperial Way. And we'll talk about in detail the Imperial Way faction of the Japanese military and government. And that basically is goes back to uh, what I talked to you in the first presentation, which is Hako Ichiyu, which means bringing the eight corners of the world under the benevolent rule of the emperor. And so that group, uh, the, the Imperial Way group, really believes that they have a divine mission uh, so that they can get all humanity to be get the benefits of living under this divine being, the Tenno or the emperor. Well, another thing I wanted to talk about was this term, Gekko Kujo. And Gekko Kujo simply means that it's government of men driven by moral principle supersedes a government of law. Well, how does that work? Well, simply this. It's, it's used as a justification by junior military people that they know what's right for Japan, they know what's right for the country, and don't stand in our way. That put it very simply. Uh so they're motivated by moral principles, uh, and where this, I think, really stems from is, uh, with these junior officers in particular, is the economic conditions of Japan at this time. So we've seen post-World War I that the Japanese economy had begun to suffer greatly. And the Japanese government will issue bonds. And these bonds will be called back in in 1927, trying to boost the economy up. <laughs> well, when these bonds are, are, are called in in 1927, it causes a run on Japanese banks. So previous to the Great Depression of 1929, we can already see that Japan is having significant issues with uh, their economy. And of course, then when the Great Depression of 1929 comes about, then their economy really goes in the tank. Now, why is this important for, for this piece? Is there are, It's young officers. These are people that have come from perhaps very poor farming, particularly backgrounds. And they are the best and brightest of their family in order to get, become military officers. It's very difficult for people of this status to get in to become officers. So these people are are good, you know, officers, young officers, and their families are writing them letters from home. And their families are saying, you know, oh, by the way, we're starving to death. We have no money. Uh, I've just sold your sister into prostitution. Uh, so these people are very, very, very unhappy with the status of Japan at this time because of the Great Depression and previous economic issues. So they will see this as a problem of two things. First, it will be a problem of the democratic government. So the democratic government has caused these problems. And the other thing they will see is, is a problem with the zaibatsu, or the capitalists. So they want to create a different type of state to address these problems that they are, are very concerned with. Well, we'll see acts of Gekko Kujo not just in regards to basically overthrowing the government, but uh, aggressive actions on the Asian mainland uh, that will be taken by the Japanese military without any regard whatsoever for, for their officers back in Japan. So they will break the rules. Uh, they will uh, try to assassinate uh, Zaibatsu. Uh, they will try to assassinate prime ministers. They will assassinate other military leaders that don't agree with their particular faction. So all these things are going to be part of Gekko Kujo, this, I know what's right, I'm going to fix it, I know what how to do this. And we'll see that uh, the Japanese court system isn't always opposed to this thinking. So, uh, And so basically, another major piece is going to be a forcing the Japanese military out of Siberia by their government. And so Gekko Kujo really is going to make the military 
as time goes on, as we get into the later 30s, the military is going to control the government, and that will be the end of, of democratic uh, government completely in Japan at that point. So, But because these young officers are willing to kill senior officers that don't agree with them, I think that the senior officers actually become a little bit afraid of their juniors. And they're willing to basically cave in to some of this bad behavior. Sometimes it's just they're going to get an advantage out of it, that we'll see in Manchuria, for example. And they are not going to, you know, prevent it at that point. But also, I think there's an issue with the Japanese people themselves, as we'll see, the Japanese people also somewhat support this behavior. Well, we get to the how these things are starting to develop. I wanted to really briefly talk about the 1921 British Imperial Conference. And this is a conference that's brought together after World War I has ended. Basically, the Dominions are going to get together. And they're going to talk about how the future of the British Empire should be uh, going forward after World War I. And so there's also this alliance we talked about with Japan. And that alliance was from 1902, and it was incredibly uh, helpful to the Japanese, particularly in the uh, Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905. The British helped them out. And this has been going on, of course, since 1902, but it's going to end this July of 1921. And the, the Imperial Conference, well, what are we going to do in Asia? How are we going to go forward? And should we renew this, this agreement with Japan? And they're not going to necessarily do that. There's a bunch of issues between both countries. Uh, of course, we talked about the racial equality clause at the League of Nations that the British basically turned down. So that aggravates the Japanese. The Japanese have put in the 21 uh, de uh, demands on China, and the 21 demands on China would threaten British concessions in China. So that was put down. And of course, now the British are very leery of Japanese interests in China threatening their concessions. And the Japanese are also unhappy about interest rates. So the Japanese are getting interest rates that are equivalent to the same as Egypt and Turkey, which are very undeveloped countries. And the Japanese feel that the British are discriminating against them for that reason. So there's all this friction. Well, what I found is that Australia actually wanted to have this treaty renewed. And the reason was is they didn't think the United States was going to be a good partner in the future because uh, the United States, almost immediately after World War I, becomes isolationist, which I, I actually found a little bit surprising. That, but they don't see the United States as a, as a partner that they can rely on in the Pacific area. Canada, on the other hand, very much wants to be have this uh, treaty ended because they are trying to curry favor with the United States, which is, of course, their largest trading partner. Britain as a whole really is more aligned with the thinking of uh, the United States. I mean, certainly we are a colony, as you may remember. Uh, and so we have a lot more in common, they feel, with the United States. And, of course, the United States is the largest economic power in the world. So they're going to say, you know, we're going to let this treaty go bye-bye because basically the United States isn't particularly in favor of this. But they do one other thing. They ask the United States to have a conference to reduce armaments, which will be the famous Washington Naval Conference of 1921-22. Japan's going to go to that conference, but Japan is now very, very leery and very unhappy with not just the United States, but of course, Britain as well. And that brings us to the Washington Naval Conference. Now, this is a very all-encompassing piece. We'll talk a lot about this, but so it's not just about naval. It will be about many other things as well. But so basically, the idea is that they're trying to avoid a future arms race. Uh, and of course, there's an economic downturn worldwide post-World War I. Not so bad in Britain, by the way, because they are building 
numerous cargo ships because they lost so many cargo ships to the German submarines in World War One. So they're, they're, the British economy at this point is actually going fairly well, but Japan, United States, et cetera, economies are kind of shaky. And the United States is committed during World War I to build this giant fleet of battleships and battle cruisers. We are committed to building 50 battleships and battle cruisers quickly. The difference between a battleship and a battle cruiser, a battle cruiser has the same armament of a battleship, but it's less well defended. It doesn't have as much armor. And the idea is that these will be faster ships because they have less, you know, it's the old engineering story. You can make things, you know, faster, cheaper, et cetera. And so the sacrifice is to make these faster is going to be armor. That's the difference between a battleship and a battle cruiser real quickly. Well, the U.S. is going to have 50 of these. The Japanese are planning on what they call the 8-8 program. They're going to build eight battleships and eight battle cruisers. So again, that's a huge expense for Japan. Everybody's arming, and the, the British, you know, they've got a, the largest navy in the world at this time, too. So again, all this costs money. And the, the decision is basically they're going to reduce armaments because nobody wants to spend this much. And it, it really makes a lot of sense if, if you think about it. So the U.S. goals are simply that they want to limit Japanese naval expansion. They want to avoid antagonizing Britain. We want to have a good relation. And you may remember that in the Treaty of Versailles, the Japanese received all the German possessions north of the equator. So that would be, for example, uh, the Marshall Islands, the Mari Marianas Islands, etc. We don't want them to fortify those. We also want them to accept the open door policy in China. British, they really want to go back to status quo. They want to maintain Hong Kong. They want to you know, keep their possessions of Singapore and the Malay Peninsula, Burma, et cetera, and the Dominion countries, particularly India, the crown jewel of their empire. <clears throat> the Japanese, of course, they want to limit naval power, uh, but... They want recognition of their special interests in Manchuria, Mongolia, which they don't have, by the way. Yap, Siberia, Tsingtao. Tsingtao is in the Shandong province of, of uh, China, which is uh, the previous possession of the Germans. So that's right, a big piece on the Chinese mainland. And, of course, they don't want to leave Siberia, which they... <laughs> shouldn't be there anyway, but they don't want to, they don't want to get out of there. Now, one of the key things about this, and this is always going to happen in, in this era, is our ability to read codes. We can read all the Japanese diplomatic codes at this time. Now that goes in and out, but it's going to be particularly important at the end of World War II that we can read their codes. And we know all their what their acceptable limits are. So we know exactly what they're willing to, to take. And they don't have anything. They can't hide it from us because we're reading all their mail. Well, so the big picture on this is simply this. The United States and Great Britain look at it this way. Well, the United States, we have two coasts. We have an East Coast. We have a West Coast. We need a Navy, a Navy in the Atlantic. We need a Navy in the Pacific. So we need a bigger Navy. The British, of course, have worldwide possessions, so they need a larger navy. Okay, The Japanese, all you have to worry about is the Western Pacific. So you don't need as big a navy as we do. And then, of course, there's the French and the Italians, and basically, well, all you guys need to worry about is the Mediterranean. So you've got those pieces of how this is going to work. And they're going to give fixed ratios. So the famous number is 553. Five, Britain 5, U.S. 5, Japan 3. And they're going to have a 10-year moratorium on building battleships. And when you build battleships in the future, they have to remain at 35,000 tons. They cannot be any larger than that. So, for example, the USS Alabama is, in effect, a treaty battleship. It was built to this 35,000-ton limit. Um, many of these ships are going to be destroyed that are under construction. 
Uh, many older ships are going to be uh, scrapped because, you know, they need to get down on how many ships everybody has. Now, a couple of battle cruisers are going to be converted to aircraft carriers because they're getting tonnage for aircraft carriers. We'll see this in the next slide. And, for example, the famous Japanese aircraft carrier Akagi is originally a Japanese battle cruiser, but it's converted to a aircraft carrier. Two U.S. ships, similar idea that were battle cruisers under construction are the Lexington and the Saratoga. So you can see that many World War II aircraft carriers come from this treaty. Well, the Japanese people and the Japanese nationalist groups are extremely angry about this uh, because basically they're considered to be a second-class citizen now. Always the Japanese are angry about anything that they view as a slight about their position in the world. But there are a couple of groups within the Japanese Navy. One is known as the Treaty Faction, and one is known as the Fleet Faction. Well, the Treaty Faction see this as an advantage because they could never win a, a, a arms race with the United States and Great Britain. They, they understand it. And this is actually an advantage because they wanted 553. Five, because originally they were basically going to get half. They were going to get 5.5, five, 2.5. And the idea for them is always this idea that if we look back at the Battle of Tsushima, which we talked about last week, they are expecting to have a giant fleet engagement. And the Japanese are going to win this giant fleet engagement. Now, how are they going to win it easily is because half of the U.S. fleet is in the Atlantic, they only have to fight half the U.S. fleet in the Pacific. So three is bigger than 2.5, and that is an advantage to them. So their goal is always to have this giant fleet engagement, much like Tushima, that they are going to win. Because, of course, they're just better. And, of course, they've got a slight advantage in ships. So the, the fleet faction is totally against this, of course. but And the Japanese people are very, very unhappy as well. Well... When we look at these numbers, we can see it here. So the British Empire is going to get 525,000 tons of battleships and battle cruisers. The United States, 525,000 tons. The Empire of Japan gets 315,000. France and Italy, they get 175,000 apiece. They're not happy about this either, but they are basically they have no choice. Nobody can win this arms race. And you can see the aircraft carrier tonnages there as well. So... It's really to Japan's advantage to accept this. But a lot of the Japanese certainly don't see it as such. Well, then there's two other pieces to this treaty that we'll talk about today. There's actually more. But for our purposes, there's going to be the Four Power Treaty between Britain, France, Japan. And basically, that is the treaty that they will maintain the status quo of those little islands. Look at it that way. So... They're not going to be able to fortify the Marianas. Uh, we are allowed to continue to fortify uh, uh, Oahu uh, in, in the Hawaiian Islands. The British can continue to fortify Singapore. But all these other little islands that we could fortify, for example, Wake, uh, Midway, Guam, we are not going to fortify. And the Japanese really aren't going to fortify theirs either. So that's kind of the crux of the four power agreement. The more important one for our purposes today is the nine power agreement, which is also going to include China. Now, China basically at the Treaty of Versailles is gives up the Shandong province to Japan, which was previously controlled by the Germans. And this is a huge gain for the for the uh, Japanese at the Treaty of Versailles. And we, of course, always are pushing the United States wants this open door policy. Uh, so, but we're going to support Chinese sovereignty in the same time, which is going to very, very be unhappy for the Japanese because they're going to affirm the open door policy. What we're going to do in the Nine Power Agreement and the Japanese government, and I'll say liberal government, I think that's probably. A, Way, way more than they are, but we'll just use their liberal democratic government as a term. 
uh, basically agrees to this. And so Japanese are going to give back to China, the Shandong province. Uh, they're also at this time going to have to give back uh, Vladivostok and Siberia. This is also incredibly going to anger the Japanese people because they deserve this, because they are the Yamato people. And by the way, we want it fair and square. That's how they'll look at it. And this is going to cause more and more problems for the uh, the liberal democratic government of Japan when they agree to these terms. Because what's happened is, is pretty much the biggest gains they got out of the Treaty of Versailles and their participation in World War I are now gone. And they also are very unhappy with the fact that, the well, the British, they get to keep Hong Kong. Everybody else gets to keep their concessions. Why are we forced to give up our concession? So, again, it's going to cause much, much more anger in the Japanese people towards the West because they always feel that they're being discriminated against by Western powers and their control of China. So that's a key factor, of course, going forward. Well, that's going to lead us to the Manchurian incident. And this is certainly a critical piece of 1931. Now, remember, the economy of the world by 1931 is in very, very bad shape. And the Japanese think that they need to get back on the continent, just not just Korea, but they need living space. They need to get control of these areas. And so the Imperial Way faction is going to try to think that their goal is to get... Uh, you know, I've talked a little bit about Imperial Way, but the faction is simply this, that they wish to control Siberia. They think that Russia is the biggest issue because they're a threat to the, to the Kokutai. They believe that the spiritual power of the Japanese soldier is so important that it outweighs the ability for uh needs for a lot of armaments. So basically, they don't need the best tanks, they don't need the best guns, because their soldiers are so superior because of their fighting spirit that they don't need to worry about that, that they they can overcome that. So that's kind of the issue with the Imperial Way faction. The control faction, on the other hand, is much different. They're much more like the Germans. Um, they believe that in order for Japan to become really a great power, that Japan needs to get more mechanization, needs to have better armaments, needs to have better industries. And their goal is always to go after China because they think by controlling China, that will give them the natural resources they need in order to create this type of Kokutai or national polity. Both both support the emperor. Don't, don't get that confused. But... There's just a complete difference of how they want to go about this piece. Uh, and again, the, the control faction, I would compare them much more to a German style. Uh, they, For example, they, they're willing to nationalize industry. Both want to nationalize industry. They don't really like the Zaihatsu. Uh, they really think that national industry is better. But again, the control faction would look more like Nazi Germany then it would look for the imperial way. And why would I say that? Well, when we think of Nazi Germany, when we look at the word Nazi, what does that stand for? It stands for the National Socialist German Workers' Party. So there's always this piece with the Nazis where they are basically want state control of the, at least the armaments industry, if not more. So a similar idea with the uh, with the with the control faction as well. Well, there's going to be a fight between Soviet Union and China in 1929. And in 1929, uh, the basically the Soviets easily defeat China. And they take uh, control of a key railroad in Man in excuse me, in Mongolia. And this railroad in Mongolia, and then they will then set up a new Mongolian People's Republic. This will be a Soviet communist satellite state in Mongolia. And 
the Japanese really don't like this, okay? They are really unhappy because, first of all, they want Mongolia. They also want Man Manchuria. But they see communism now getting closer and closer to their territory, the territory they feel is theirs. And so they're very unhappy about this. And we talked a little bit about what's known as the Kwantung Army. And the Kwantung Army at this point is basically in North Korea. It's basically, I would say, the best army in Japan. And it's there to prevent incursions from the Soviet Union into Japanese areas. And so the Kwantung Army is almost virtually controlled by the Imperial Way faction. And they're going to create an incident because they want, they got to go into Manchuria now because they're afraid that the Russians are going to take it because they've made this uh, incursion into Mongolia. And so what they're going to do is they're going to have an incident. We need a reason to go to war. And so what they do is they have a railroad that is under Japanese control in Manchuria, and they put a little bit of explosives on uh, this railroad. And they set it off. And that's the reason that now, well, this must have been done by the Chinese, so we're going to have to go after these guys. Well, the amount of explosives they use is so small that... Two hours after the explosion, that railroad is back and functioning and Japanese troop trains are rolling over that railroad. So they didn't do a lot of damage to, to their railroad uh, in order to create this incident. But that's how that starts. So at this point, we see Japanese Kwantung Army advancing along the rail lines and capturing Manchurian city after city after city. And this is strictly Gekokujo because this hasn't been approved at all by Imperial Japanese headquarters or the Japanese government. These guys just do this completely on their own. And the Japanese government's like, wait, 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 no, stop, you can't do this, okay? I mean, what are you doing? We, we didn't authorize an invasion of Manchuria. You guys are just doing this on your own. But it's going really well. It's going so well that the Imperial Japanese Army goes, you know, maybe we should just send in three more divisions and we'll just capture Manchuria because this is going very, very well. So once in a while, Gekko Kujo does get approved. But it's it's amazing to me that this would, would even... I, I think about the United States Army deciding to invade Canada. I mean, it, it's just not going to happen. But that's what happens. And the Chinese, on the other hand, they're very, very, very concerned by this, of course. But you realize that the Chinese government at this time is very, very weak and disorganized. For example, Manchuria is not run by the nationalist government under Chiang Kai-shek. Manchuria is run by a warlord who is known as the Young Marshal. His father, the old marshal, was murdered by the Japanese, I believe, in 1928. But so he's not particularly fond of the Japanese. Obviously, they killed his father, but he doesn't feel that he's powerful enough to stop this incursion. So basically, they just let the Japanese roll through. And the Chinese people in general and are very, very, you know, the government's not protecting us. You know, the Japanese are just doing whatever they want. And Chiang Kai-shek also at this time, he feels that I don't have the power to face the Japanese. I still need to consolidate my power. So Chiang Kai-shek is basically by Shanghai and Nanking, as you can see on the map. Manchuria is being controlled still by a warlord. And we talked about how this is known as the warlord era of the century of humiliation in China. So they decide not to fight. And, you know, the Japanese, what they're going to do is now they're, they've got Manchuria and they're going to create a new country. They're going to call it Manchuko. And Manchuko will be the head of state of this puppet government, will be the former emperor of China. Remember, he is overthrown. He's actually a very young boy. And when uh, Sun Yat-sen overthrows the uh, Chinese empire. And he is now going to be put in place by the Japanese to be in control of Manchuko. Now, of course, he has no real power. But it, it's a really a propaganda move on the, on the part of the Japanese to show that they've created a new Chinese state. 
So again, it, it's just amazing that that all this stuff just can go on uh, without the really the authority of the Japanese government initially. Well, now there's going to be more and more incidents. And one thing I probably should have mentioned first is the London aspect of the Naval Treaty. That takes place in 1930. And so originally in the uh, the Washington Treaty, the Naval Treaty, originally they didn't limit cruisers or the destroyers or submarines. And so there's another conference in 1930 in London where they're going to limit all that too. So basically you can't build a cruiser that's over 10,000 tons. Uh, submarines have to be 2,000 tons dry weight. Uh, so all these pieces are, are added on to that treaty. And that, of course, aggravates the Japanese even more because, again, they get a lower number. Well, what happens then is, is that young officers in the fleet faction, they are really, really unhappy. And, of course, they're supporting Imperial Way. And what they're going to do is they're so mad. Again, the economy's terrible. Their families are struggling. They're going to have what they refer to as a Showa restoration. Now, we've talked about the Meiji restoration. Meiji is the name of the reign of, of what will become Emperor Meiji. When you die, you take the name of your reign. Showa restoration will be in regards to Emperor Hirohito, who at this time is still known as Emperor Hirohito, not as Emperor Showa. So for today, since he's passed away, he is now known as Emperor Showa. So they want to have a show of restoration. Well, what does that mean? They want to take all power to the benevolent emperor, to an emperor that is part of a divine power, that he will be totally in control of the government and the Japanese people. They will not have any diet or liberal democracy. That's their goal. And... In order to achieve this goal, there are going to be a significant amount of violence. Uh, for example, there's another group that these young officers will be associated with called the League of Blood. The League of Blood uh, tries to kill politicians. They actually murder the uh, head of the Mitsui Corporation. And these young 11 officers are going to get involved with these guys. And what they're going to do on May 15th is they're going to assassinate the Prime Minister of Japan. They're also going to kill Charlie Chaplin. Now, you may wonder, why would they want to kill Charlie Chaplin? Yeah, I'll wonder about that, too. Okay, well, <laughs> simple this. In their minds, that if they killed, by the way, Charlie Chaplin is visiting the Prime Minister of Japan. And if they kill Charlie Chaplin, too, that that will start a war with America. Now, I'm not sure how that works, considering Charlie Chaplin is a British citizen, but for somehow this made sense to them. I, I, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, Bob Hope's not in, China, in Japan at this time. Now, how does Charlie Chaplin survive? Well, he went out to a sumo wrestling match with the son of the prime minister. So he's not home. So the 11 guys walk in and they murder the prime minister. What do they do next? They go to the police department and turn themselves in. So how does that resonate with the Japanese people? Well, this is critical, I think, because... There's going to be a trial for these 11 naval officers, and they're going to use it as a platform to talk about their vision of the new Japan that they want to create under the Showa Restoration. This resonates immensely with the Japanese people. 350,000 Japanese citizens will sign petitions in blood in order to support these 11 officers. 11 students offer to take their place if they're to be executed. And just to show that they're serious, they cut off their little fingers and put them in a pickle jar and send them to uh, the judges. So they're, they're, these people are serious. Now, where does, this, where does this thinking come from? 
And I would say, we talked about first class about Saigo Takamori and his rebellion against the Meiji Emperor. And Saigo's rebellion, of course, he loses. He commits seppuku or ritual suicide. And then years later, Emperor Meiji pardons him. He sets a precedent where this kind of behavior is acceptable. Another key piece in this regard, and I think dates to the Japanese appreciation, I'll use that word, of what's known as the 47 Ronin. So the 47 Ronin, you may remember that they avenged the death of their leader. Uh, they then turned themselves into the authorities and they were, instead of being executed, they were allowed to commit seppuku or ritual suicide. This resonates heavily with the Japanese people, even into the 1930s. That this kind of behavior, again, if moral principle is more important than law, and these guys make a big show of it. Then comes an, another very odd event, I would say, is called the October Incident. And the October incident takes place in October of 1932. And there's a military, the, the, the Kwantung army is very much afraid that the Japanese, I use the term again, liberal democracy, uh, is going to give back Manchuria. So once again, they're going to lose all their gains. Mm -hmm. So what they're going to do is they want to prevent the government from squandering the fruits of our victory in Manchuria. So one of the uh, officer, key officer, really junior officer in Manchuria in the Kwantung Army, he's going back to Japan without permission. He just leaves his post. He meets up with another key leader of the 1st Imperial Guards Division. These are the people that basically control the emperor's residence, and it's the main military force in Tokyo. And they go there and they start to recruit people. We're going to recruit people in order to have a revolution, have an insurrection. And so he goes there and he, they start recruiting. And they get a couple of battalions of soldiers to agree to this. They also get 10 naval bombers to agree to this. So they're starting to get some traction. Well, some of the people they've contracted they're not really in favor of this. And they basically go to the authorities and say, you know, hey, this is going on. So the leadership of the Japanese army goes to these two guys and they go, you know, you really shouldn't be doing this. You know, really, you need to stop. And they're like, no, we're not going to. No, we, we know what's right. We're not going to stop. Well, at that point, the Japanese military has to take some action against them. What action do they take? Well, the leader of the Imperial Guards, uh, that, that officer, he gets 20 days of home confinement. The officer that abandoned his post in the Kwantung Army and came to Japan without authorization, he gets 10 days home confinement. And everybody else involved with it, they basically post them to different areas so that they won't cause trouble in Tokyo at this time. So once again, you see that they're really not taking this very seriously. Well, that leads to the a, a big event. That's the 226 incident of 1936. So, again, they want to create this militaristic state socialist system. That's their goal. And what they're hoping to do is they can get rid of corrupt party politics. They're going to revamp Japan in order to save the, uh, the the Kokutai and and basically create a, a much better state for Japan. Well, so the Imperial Way faction always wants to focus on Russia, and they're, certainly they're going to try to do that as well. So they want to overthrow the government. And it's going to be a political struggle between these two factions within the military. So the Imperial Way faction... And the control faction are struggling within the Japanese army itself. And the control faction gets a little bit ahead of them, and they manage to take General Mazaki, and Mazaki is going to be basically taken out of a key position. And 
this angers the Imperial Way faction immensely, that this control faction guy has, has maneuvered our guy out of power. Well, there's a, a, a lieutenant colonel, and his name is Aizawa. And Aizawa blames General Nagata for getting uh, Mazaki out of power. So he walks into Mazaki's, or excuse me, into Nagata's office and murders him. And then, of course, he turns himself in, which is how you're supposed to handle this. And again, this becomes another one of these show trials. It's going to be, he's going to get on his soapbox. And even the judges are starting to collude with this policy. And they go so far as to refer to him as a simple soldier who sought only to reform the army and the nation according to the true national principles. Now, I think if you walked into a, a, a U.S. Army post and you, you murdered your commanding officer or a senior general, I think you'd be in a little bit more of an issue than, uh, you know, having being thought of as a simple soldier. But that is how this is going on. Well, this is going to spur to action a key factions within the Imperial Way group that are at the first division, the Imperial Guards Division. And they're going to say, aha. Uh -huh, this is an opportunity because we've got all this good press going with this Aizawa incident. This is our chance. And, oh, by the way, we're all being transferred to Manchuria, so we're not going to be at the seat of power anymore. So what are they going to do? They're going to have the rebellion, in effect, the 226 incident. So what they're going to do is they're going to assassinate prominent enemies, many of them admirals, generals, politicians, Zaihatsu. And they basically want to do this. It's a very, very strange to me. They want to have General Mazaki form a new government. General Mazaki isn't even aware that they want him to do this at this time. But that's their goal. And then, of course, they want to have the Shoah restoration. Well, Aside from the fact that if the Emperor Hirohito doesn't really want the Showa restoration, well, maybe what we need to do is we need to get another emperor. And they're going to they're willing to replace Hirohito with his younger brother, Prince Chichibu. So it, it, it's it's kind of interesting that you know we're doing this for the emperor. If the emperor doesn't want it, well, we'll just get another emperor. And so they create what they call the Righteous Army. It's 1,558 soldiers that are willing to take part in this activity. And they're going to make assassination groups. They're going to take over uh, the radio stations. They're going to surround the Imperial Palace. They're going to shut down the newspapers. And they do all these things about 5 in the morning. And about 5.50 a.m., the emperor realizes what's going on. And his war minister, uh, Kawashima, he says, maybe what we need to do is we need to form a new cabinet because we need to clarify the Kokutai, stabilize the national life, and fulfill national defense. And Hirohito's like, what? I don't think so. Okay, I think what we need to do is we need to put down the rebellion right now. And... Then the government, the liberal democratic government, they all offer to resign. And 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 Hirohito's like, I'll tell you what, you put down the rebellion. Once we put down the rebellion, you can then try to resign. But right now we're we're putting down the rebellion. This is not this is not happening. And so what's their goal as far as their assassination list? I've got, oh, they're going to kill the prime minister. They're going to kill a former prime minister. All, many of these people are admirals and generals, as you can see on the chart. And why are they going to kill them? Well, you support the London Naval Treaty. You support the organ theory. Told you that organ theory isn't good for your health. Uh, and so they're going to kill these people for various and sundry reasons, basically, that they don't agree with, that they think is, is detrimental to the imperial way. And so I broke this down into, into three groups. We have the top three, they all survived their assassination attempts. Uh, 
and if you read the uh, book I recommend, one of the books I recommended, uh, which is uh, The Rising Sun by John Tolan, there's a really excellent explanation of how uh, Prime Minister Okada survives. It's very strange how he survives. It's almost Keystone Cops. Uh, the bottom three gentlemen, they do not survive. They're murdered by the assassination groups. And then in the middle, we have uh, Suzuki, Suzuki Kantaro. Probably more in English, we would refer to him as Kantaro Suzuki, Kantaro being his first name, Suzuki being his last. Well, Admiral Suzuki, they barge into his house, a group of uh, soldiers and an officer, and the officer shoots him a couple times in the chest. And they're then going to finish him off with a sword. And his wife intervenes. She, she jumps on top of his body and says, he's dying anyway, I will take care of this. And so the officer says, well, that makes sense. And so he orders his men to salute the admiral as he's bleeding to death on the floor, and they all leave. Well, he survives, strangely enough, uh, and uh, even though he's shot several times in the chest. And he goes on at the end of World War II to become the prime minister of Japan, and he is one of the people that is involved heavily in their surrender. So at the time, he's a very old man, and he's not in particularly good physical health because, quite honestly, they shot him a few times, and he's old. But he is actually the prime minister of Japan when World War II ends. Well, <clears throat> the emperor's chief advisor, who also plays a huge part at the end of World War II, is Koichi Kido. And he's a marquis. He's part of one of these other royal families. And he's basically the... Hirohito's closest advisor, and he tells Hirohito, "We're not. This has been going on for a couple of days, by the way." And he tells him, "We're not giving in. Okay, we are going to put this rebellion down." And the army is like vacillating. They're like, "Well, maybe we should, you know, let this go." And you know, may, they're doing, they're trying to do the right thing. These junior officers, and Hirohito's like, "No, no, that's not what we're going to do." In fact, what I'm going to do is if you don't fix this right away, I'm going to take personal command of the 1st Division and put this thing down myself. Well, that's just shames the Japanese military that, that Hirohito would actually take command of a division. He's a divine person. And so that is a huge, huge issue. Also, Hirohito has done something else, though. He's brought the Navy in, by the way, and they've sent 40 ships to Tokyo Bay. And also, they've got Japanese Marines there as well now. So he's got a little bit more firepower than just the taking control of the 1st Division. But he makes that statement, and that basically ends the rebellion. And so the leaders of the rebellion, they're going to do, several of them are going to commit seppuku, ritual suicide. But others decide that they're going to, to just go back because they were told via the radio that if they returned to their units, all crimes would be forgiven. And this is a particular major issue for the non-commissioned officers that have taken place in this. Well, so remember, 75 of these guys went back to uh, their barracks immediately as soon as they were told to early in this event. So 1,483 are actually going to be interrogated, and 124 are going to be prosecuted. It's 19 officers, 73 NCOs, 19 soldiers, and 10 civilians. So basically, uh, 43, all the officers, 43 NCOs, and all the civilians are found guilty. 17 of the 19 officers will be executed. Now, how does this go down? Because they're going to have a different deal with trial. This trial isn't going to be like the previous ones. So, first of all, the trial will be in secret. Second of all, they will not get any uh, uh, legal assistance. So, basically, they're on their own. Thirdly, the judges don't care about their political beliefs. All they care about is what did you do? Did you did you kill a prime minister? You know, you know. So that really changes the whole aspect of this trial so it's not put in the press it's not it becomes a big piece for the japanese civilian population to get behind and indeed these people are punished severely well 
What is the results of this, though, are, are very detrimental to Japan. And real briefly, in 1900, this form of government that we are that is available at this time is really created. And what it is, is you have to have an army minister and you have to have a navy minister. The army and navy minister, if they resign, the government falls immediately and you have to create a new government. Well, you would think that's a problem if they have, the military has complete control of the government, but that's not quite how it works early on. Is because most of these people are retired. So it doesn't quite function as radically as it will. So what's going to happen now after this event is the government, the war minister, excuse me, the army minister and the navy minister are going to be serving officers. They're not the head officer, so they can be ordered by their commanders to resign. So the minute they do that, of course, the government falls and a new government has to be created. But it has to be created with the Army and the Navy combined in order to come to a consensus. So they have complete control, basically, of the government at that time. There's still a civilian government in 1936, but really is totally controlled by the military at that time. So the 226 incident causes another thing is the Imperial Way faction is greatly discredited. This gives the control faction way more power than they had previously. Another factor is the emperor feels that he has overstepped his constitutional bounds by basically threatening to take control of the division and, and getting involved in all these politics. Remember, the emperor's goal always was that there would be a consensus of the Japanese government, and when they reach that consensus, then he automatically approves it. He now feels that he has overstepped that, and in the future, he's going to be much more cautious about doing this. And of course, now, of course, the way is open for the imperial, uh, excuse me, for the control faction to, to attack China. Well, we're going to touch briefly on this because, quite honestly, uh, I covered this in great detail in my previous class, Asia Pacific War, and uh, you all have access to the YouTube site. So uh, if you want to get more involved with this, but I just want to top line this for today's purposes. So, of course, we got the same issue with the Great Depression. The Japanese wish to expand. Uh, they need to get more control of uh, the land resources of, of the Asian continent. And I use the term Lebensraum, which would be living space in Germany. And unlike Germany, of course, which when Germany wants living space, they're going to do a polite term will be ethnic cleansing. Uh, it's probably <laughs> a little less than reality, but uh, they will use that term. They're going to do, the Japanese do not want to do ethnic cleansing. The Japanese wish to be bring the eight corners of the world under the benevolent rule of the emperor. And of course, that is going to be uh, not ethnic cleansing. Of course, the children, the Japan being the father of the Asian nations, the children must obey, of course. And if you don't, you're in trouble. But quite honestly, that is the goal it, it really in this war. And Kanoe, we've talked about Prince Kanoe. He is now the prime minister of Japan. And he's going to agree to this. And we talked about the Chinese government being in a chaotic state, which they are, but they've gotten a lot better between 1931 and 1937. But there's always these incidents between these two countries. There's incidents in uh, particularly Shanghai in 32. The Japanese in 1932 go so far as to begin to bomb the city of Shanghai. But that incident is smoothed over primarily by the League of Nations, uh, which they're both members of uh, at that particular moment. And then, of course, is going to come the famous Marco Polo Bridge incident of July 7, 1937. And the Marco Polo Bridge incident is simply that there's a, a Chinese and Japanese military get into a, 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 a firefight, in effect, uh, it's almost put down, but uh, for various and sundry reasons, uh, the Japanese local commanders, with Gekko Kujo again involved, 
they began to stress that this needs to be into a much bigger event. And of course, it's going to now lead to a major war between China and Japan. The reason is because Chiang Kai-shek at this point decides that he can no longer let Japan push him around anymore. So the Chinese basically make a decision that they've had enough of this and they're going to stop it. And that's going to lead to a major war between uh, Japan and China. So really, the Japanese army goes to the emperor and says, hey, don't worry about this. Not a problem. It's only going to last three months, and then we're going to take over China. China will give in after three months. Well, of course, China doesn't give in after three months. China will go on to fight all the way into 1945. So this three-month incursion turns into a much, much bigger deal. And Japan really is very, very uh, concerned by this. I mean, they're winning victory after victory. They've taken Shanghai. They've taken Nanking. They've driven uh, Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists all the way into the interior of China in the city of Chongqing. And yet they don't quit. And... Japan's trying to end this war because they want they don't want this war to continue. They expected it only to be three months, and it's dragging on for years. And they it's costing money and a lot of casualties. Well, it's also causing them a lot of problems as far as the international community. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of things that basically tie into the United States at this point. And one of them, of course, is the Panay incident. The United States has concessions in China. We have gunboats, U.S. military stationed in China to protect U.S. interests. And so the war is broken out, and the Hanay, you can see it here, it's sitting on the bottom of the Yangtze River because it's been sunk, and it is trying to escort three U.S. tankers out of the Yangtze River and get out of Dodge, basically, to get out of trouble. And a Japanese naval aircraft carrier, from an aircraft carrier come and sink the Pene. The Japanese government says, oh, we're really sorry. Uh, we didn't mean to sink the Pene. And by the way, here's $2 million, and we're, we're going to apologize profusely. It goes to the point where even Japanese citizens go to the U.S. Embassy and try to donate money to the people that were killed and injured on the Pene. Of course, the U.S. Embassy is like, uh, we we." Don't, don't give us any money, please. Uh, we don't need to do this. Now, historian and uh, basically he's an intelligence historian is John Prados. And John Prados makes the claim that the Japanese, because again, we had broken their codes, intentionally sank the Pan A. Again, it was a junior officer on this aircraft carrier. The, they see the Pan A and he goes, go ahead and sink it. I don't care. It's an American ship. So once again, the Japanese are lying about the fact that they didn't intentionally sink the Pene. Of course, we can't tell them that because we don't want them to know we're reading their codes. So you see, this code thing just comes on forever and ever in World War and leading up to World War II. I just think that's kind of fascinating. Another key event that takes place is the rape of Nanking. This causes another huge issue with the United States. What happens is Nanking is surrounded by the Japanese forces. The Chinese army that's now trapped in Nanking realizes they can't surrender to Japan because they will be murdered. They begin to take off their uniforms and try to blend in with the people. The Japanese find out about this. They're furious, and they make the decision that they're going to just kill all the young men. And so if you found a young man in, in Nanking, you have to assume that he's in the military, and you're just going to murder him. There's also going to be six weeks of rape and pillage and just terrible events going on in Nanking at this time. Now, some people would say there's 300,000 dead in this six weeks. Some people would say there's 50,000. It doesn't matter. What does matter is this takes place. And it's been witnessed by Western powers. There's an international community in the middle of Shanghai, and both sides, the Chinese and the Japanese, respect this international community. 
So this international community can see everything that's going on. And this is all reported into the press. So everybody in the world knows the behavior of the Japanese troops has been horrendous. It's not a secret. And there's no way for them to cover it up. And this just really aggravates the United States. Uh, the United States at this time has got a fairly positive view of, of nationalist China. Uh, so much so that even my mother had a favorous view of nationalist China because she would read books like Pearl Buck's The Good Earth. And we see China at this time as sort of a fledgling democracy. But I would say, realistically, China is never a democracy. Uh, but that's how it's perceived. So this really aggravates the United States as well. When we look at this war from 37 until 40, and if you look at the map, if you, if you take the right corner out of it, because that's Manchuria, Manchukuo, and Korea. But if you take the center section where that kind of whatever color you might wish to call that, I'm not sure, uh, the darker area, uh, that is all area that's now been conquered by the Japanese at this time. And notice it goes along to all the key coastal cities. So they now control all this area. But it's come at a heavy cost. They have 185,000 dead. They have 520,000 wounded. And they have 430,000 sick. And this is a major issue for the Japanese because they, again, they need this war to end. Okay, this is a huge drain on their finances. And there are no accurate number for Chinese casualties. The most accurate number I could give you is 14 million. Okay, uh, the Japanese, for example, would claim less. The Chinese, I believe today, claim over 20 million. But it, regardless, it doesn't. The numbers don't matter. The number is just so huge. It, it that's really the issue. It's it's not worth fighting over the fact that millions are dead over this fighting. And the and the and the Japanese behavior is really atrocious. They begin to use biological warfare. They're the world leaders in biological warfare at this time. They drop what's known as flea bombs. They create a weapon where they can drop fleas on the that are contained bubonic plague onto the Chinese people. Uh, and they're so unhappy with their failures here that they create something called the three alls policy, trying to scare, terrorize the Chinese into, into surrender. And the three alls are simply kill all, loot all, and burn all. So behavior of the Japanese is, is terrible in this regard. Well, What's going to happen next? Darn it. Those Germans managed to beat the French. Woohoo! Good news. Good. Deutschland über alles. And so they're going to create something called the tripartite pact. And the tripartite pact is primarily aimed at the United States, just so we know, because nobody expects France to fall this quickly. Russia doesn't expect that. They expect to just go on for years. The United States is shocked by this. It's going to create a huge desire for us to start building up our military. And the Japanese, of course, see this as an opportunity to control Asia. And by the way, this is the only picture you will see of Adolf Hitler in any of my presentations. So there he is. You can tell by the big arrow. And Article 1 of the Tripartite Pact says... Japan recognizes, respects the leadership of Germany and Italy in the establishment of a new order in Europe. Article 2, Germany and Italy recognize, respect the leadership of Japan in creating a new order in Greater East Asia. Well, the United States, is they realize what this pact is about, and we are very, very, very unhappy about this and other things that will take place, particularly... Uh, the uh, incursion into Indochina. And this is going to lead to great amounts of tension between the United States, Britain, the Dutch, and everyone against the Axis powers, which have now been created. Well, we talked numerous times about the eight corners of the world being under Japanese control. But what they're going to try to do is they're going to create something they refer to as the 
Greater East Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere. So they wish to control not just China, but the wealth of Malaya, Burma, and particularly uh, Indo, not, excuse me, the Dutch East Indies, which we know today as Indonesia. And they feel that even Kanoe says that there's going to be a new order in Asia, and we're going to bring everybody under the fatherly benevolent rule of the emperor. And oh, by the way, if you resist, you're going to get killed. And then in 1940, Kanoe goes so far as to, because they're still fighting majorly in China, this is going on, he's going to dissolve all political parties. So there's no political parties and create a national defense state. And it'll be the national defense state that the United States and the allies will negotiate with to end World War II. It will not be with uh, the political parties of Japan. It'll be this entity that he creates in 1940. So basically what he's done is he's put Japan on a complete war footing by 1940. They're told military, everything they can to build weapons, they're doing that now. You don't see Germany go to total war industry until 1943, for example, which was probably too late for them. But they are going to create this national defense state. So all their industry, everything will be made to win the war in China and then, of course, win the war against the Allies. Well, they also signed a secret agreement, which I always kind of like this picture. And basically, how are they going to divide uh, this, this part of the world? And they're going to use the 70 uh, longitude east. And so everything to the left of that map is going to be German and Italian. And everything to the right is going to be the new Japanese empire. And so basically it's divided along the Ural Mountains in uh, Russia and down into India, as you can see on the map. So that is how they intend to divide the, divide the world at this time. Well, France has fallen, and there's a new government for France. It's a collaborationist government with the Nazis. It's referred to as Vichy. And the Japanese begin to put pressure on the Vichy government because they want to control North Vietnam. The reason they want to control North Vietnam is because of Haiphong Harbor. The, particularly the United States, but the British have been as well, are giving in about 10,000 tons of military goods per month coming in through Haiphong Harbor to support the Chinese. And the Japanese want this stopped. So they, because... France has fallen, they now realize that France is basically powerless to stop them, and they basically tell the Vichy government, hey, we're moving in, we're going to take this over, uh, but you don't, you don't mind, do you? And French basically have no power, they acquiesce. Uh, and then what happens in 1941 of June 21st is the Germans attack Russia. You know, and it's really a good thing for the uh, Japanese. They're very pleased with that because, of course, they hate Russia. And so basically at this point, they realize, you know, maybe we need to send a few more troops and, and just take the rest of uh, Indochina, or as we know it today, Vietnam. And they send 140,000 troops into this area right by Singapore. I wonder why they're sending them all there. Well, the U.S. and Britain and the Dutch, they have no, they know, they could figure this out. I mean, it's not a mystery here uh, that they're going to have some major issues with the Japanese in the very near future if, if they don't come to some sort of agreement. And the United States has begun to embargo. The first incursion in North Vietnam, we cut down, we won't sell them any scrap metal. And by the way, the Japanese cannot use the Panama Canal. When they make the move in 41, which really threatens the uh, Allies, then what's going to happen is they're going to have a huge, huge thing where they're going to freeze Japanese assets. And oh, by the way, we're not going to sell you any petroleum products. You'll get no oil, no gasoline from us. Now, Japan gets 80% of their petroleum products from the United States. 
The other 20% come from the Dutch East Indies. So that's a problem because now you've got no oil. And Japan only has a two-year supply of oil reserves. Now, why does the United States really do this? In my opinion is simply this, is we are desperate to keep Russia in the war. The last thing we need is for the Japanese to attack Russia when they're on the on the ropes from the from trying to defend themselves from the Germans. It's a that is a major, major goal of the United States. They're always trying to keep China in the war so that will distract Japan. And it makes complete sense because we don't have the military capability yet to fight World War II. We've let our army and our Navy get into a very, very poor condition. And we now need time to build up. And if we can get the Russians to hold off the Germans for a while, that will help us. It'll certainly help Great Britain because they're in major troubles too after France falls. So that's really why I think, and I think a lot of historians would back me up on this, why they're so concerned about trying to cut the oil supply. Because without oil, Japan can't really invade the Soviet Union. And of course, they're still fighting in China at the same time. Well, what does Japan want as far as this? Is They have already made, in my opinion, the decision to go south. As soon as France falls... The Germans make the bet, excuse me, the Japanese make the bet that the Germans are going to win the war. Hey, they beat France, no problem. Britain's on the ropes. They can't stop the Germans. And now, of course, uh, eventually the Germans are going to attack Russia, which is all to Japan's advantage as well. And as early as June of 1940, the Army Minister Hata he says this, seize the golden opportunity. Don't let anything stand in the way. They want to capture the southern resource area. This is the control faction wanting to win in China and to, and to get all those goodies, tin, oil, rubber, petroleum products that can all come from the southern resource area. And as North 41, the Army Vice Chief of Staff Sukata says, now is the time. If we take the South, we will be able to strike a strong blow against American resources of national defense. That is, we will build an iron wall, and within it, we will destroy one by one the enemy states of Asia. In other words, states that don't want to be part of the Greater East Asian Cold Prosperity Sphere, or Hako Ichiyu. And in addition, we will defeat America and Britain. They really believe this. It's a huge risk, though. Now, our U.S. Ambassador Joseph Grew to Japan, he says this, the German military machine and system have gone to the Japanese head like strong wine. So there's going to be some risks here. And so the Japanese are going to negotiate. We're going to negotiate. And quite honestly, we are trying to negotiate as best we can. And the Japanese say, look, okay, fine. You give us oil. And quit sending any aid to China because that's not something we want you to do. And you know what? In 25 years, we'll pull out of China and Indochina. Eventually, we'll get around to leaving. And the United States position is simply, well, okay, here's what we want you to do. You're going to abandon the tripartite pact. You're going to get out of the axis. And, oh, by the way, you're going to give up the Chinese territory you've captured. You're going to give back uh, Indochina to the French. And you're going to have the open-door policy in Asia. Well, the Japanese really can't accept that for many reasons. Uh, they should have accepted it. But the fact is they can't accept it because they've had so many casualties in China. Again, they've had a million casualties fighting Chinese that this time the Japanese military realizes that they will be put themselves in great jeopardy with the Japanese people if they agree to this. Now, they're willing to take this tremendous risk 
They're willing to put their entire population at risk of a major war that most likely even they know they have very little chance of winning. And Kanoe says, you know what I think I want to do is I want to have a direct meeting between me and President Roosevelt. And the United States says, no, we're not going to do that. Once you agree to some sort of proposal that we can all agree on, then we'll have a meeting and we'll basically sign a peace. Now, the U.S., of course, we've been trying to build up since France fell, big time. And we need more time. So we're basically stalling with some of these peace negotiations. Because the United States is under the opinion that Japan rationally will never go to war with us. They may go to attack the British. They may attack the Dutch. But they certainly should know better than to try to attack us. And we're trying to build up forces, and particularly in the Philippines. Remember the the U.S. Navy is not stationed its main battle fleet at Pearl Harbor until this time because they stationed the battle fleet at Pearl Harbor as a warning to Japan. Basically, Roosevelt says this will deter Japan from wanting to fight us if we move the fleet to Pearl Harbor. It's normally on the West Coast. Well, the Japanese Army and the Navy, they want to guess basically resolve this issue as quickly as that. they need to fight if they're going to do this they need to do it now because the u.s is getting stronger every day yes every we'd already um put a massive bill build navy and that was going on right now yes it was and it's very <laughs> easily to forecast what the navy was going to be over the next two or three years right and i'll, I'll elaborate briefly on that but it's talking about that we'd already had an increase in our Navy, which was called the two ocean Navy policy. And when I talked about the Washington Naval Agreement, remember the Japanese always want to have that little bit of extra number in the Pacific more than we will have in the Pacific. Well, the Japanese know that this fleet is coming, that they know we're building this massive new fleet. And that's one of the biggest reasons that they pushed to have this war start on December 7, 1941, because that's that window of opportunity where their fleet is actually larger than ours in the Pacific. They know that's going to shrink very, very quickly. So to his point, that is one of the driving factors for this timeline of World War II starting, uh, well, excuse me, war between the United States and Japan starting in December 7, 1941. So that's really critical that we understand that the Japanese have a time pressure here because of our buildup. Well, the Japanese know this is risky. The emperor knows this is risky. He's like, maybe this isn't such a good idea. And they force Kanoe out, and they're going to put a new gentleman in. And that is uh, General Tojo, who will now become Prime Minister Tojo. And the emperor tells Tojo, he goes, you need to continue to have conversation with the United States. We really want to have a, 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 a peace here, so we need to continue to negotiate. And Tojo says, okay, I will negotiate until the end of November 1941, for the exact reason that they are on this time pressure. And they also tell the emperor what's known as the sick patient story. They tell the emperor, Japan will die without oil. So we have to come to a resolution. We cannot give up everything that we've gained. We cannot go back. What we must do is, if we don't, if we do go back, if we give in to the United States, Japan will die as a country. But there's a chance that if we go forth with this policy to take the southern resource area and build that iron wall, there's a chance that we will be able to survive. And the emperor, again, he's confronted with a consensus. The army, the navy, what's left of the government, they all agree that they should go to war. The emperor at this feels because he's not going to override a consensus, he says, 
all right, well, then we'll we'll do this. And he signs off on it. Now, in my world, this shows a complete lack of, of any sort of morals or uh, responsibility for the Japanese military, their government, etc. That they would put their entire country at risk on this slim of a chance to win. Again, everything is dependent on the Germans winning. If the Germans win, they got a chance. Germans don't win, they have no chance. And they still go forward in this policy, and I, I think it's just reprehensible. Well, so while these negotiations are going on, up to the end of November 1941, Kido Butai, the Japanese strike force, uh, which is the Japanese aircraft carrier force, they are already at sea on their way to attack Pearl Harbor. And with that, uh, that brings us to an end today. And uh, hopefully next week, we will finally get to the atomic bomb and we will talk about the Oppenheimer movie. So thank you all for coming. Cheers.